and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ and welcome to this service of worship here at the First UP Church of Crafton Heights. So glad to have you all here on this World Communion Sunday, this Baptism Sunday, this time when a number of us are finding our way back to re-engaging in the gathered life of the church after a season of having been scattered. As we come together, I have a couple of announcements that I'd like to share. Um, the youth group is having a bonfire this evening at 6 o'clock, we hope. Uh, uh, weather permitting, we'll be at the uh, Thornburg Park, uh, the, uh, the dog park down there by the bridge. You can meet us down there at 6. If it's raining, we're going to be at the open door. Uh, and so we hope that uh, youth group folks will be a part of that. We've regained our children's Sunday school. Today was the first day of children's Sunday school. So we have uh, children and adult classes at 945. Uh, as we continue to try to figure out how to live life in uh, this age of COVID, one of the things that we're not able to do yet is to offer childcare during worship. There's a room in the back. If you have children that need to stretch a little bit or move around a little bit, there's a very large room in the back. And then there's a room with some toys in it back there. If they need to move around, if you came without children and you find that the children near you are distracting you, let me invite you to offer to help or to come and sit next to Barb because there's a lot of room in the front and Barb won't distract you. So uh, we, we, wanna, we realize that bringing children to worship sometimes can be a little bit uh, daunting and don't feel any daunting on our, on our behalf. 
we are glad that you and your children are here today. Um, I want to uh, invite you to a couple of things. Um, we're going to begin a new book discussion uh, around the book Building a Bigger Table by John Pavlovitz. That is on the 18th of this month. There are copies of the book in the back. Uh, it's going to be Zoom only. So that way if you're watching uh, from out of town and you want to be a part of that, you can do that. But uh, if you're in town, you can also do that. The copies are, of the book are in the way back. Just sign up and I'll send you the link. Also, um, we are beginning a new collaboration with the Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank. This is very exciting. Twice a month, folks uh, in our neighborhood are invited to receive two boxes of food. Uh, one box will be, uh, as I understand it, perishables, you know, uh, fresh uh, produce and breads and things like that. One box will be more shelf-stable things. Uh, and if you sign up for this program twice a month, you'll get those two boxes. There's no income requirement. Uh, all you need to do is connect. Uh, there are some uh, flyers that are hanging on the bulletin board back in that hallway as well as in the back. Also, Sherry, if you just wave your hand, you can talk to Sherry about how to get in on this. It's a great opportunity. So if you know somebody in your family or community who could benefit from this, let's work together to make sure that people aren't hungry. Um, also, I want to uh, announce that, and I'll probably stress this again, but we're having communion today. This is World Communion Sunday, and I realize that some of you came today because of the baptism, and you didn't know that we were going to have communion. We practice an open communion here at Crafton Heights. If you love Jesus and want to be claimed by Jesus, then you're welcome to. You don't have to have signed anything. You don't have to be a member. You have to want to be hosted by Jesus at this meal. The way that we're going to do communion, uh, and this is the first time since last epiphany of 2020, I think, that we're doing it this way. We're going to invite you to come forward for communion. Uh, and so uh, the musicians will come first, and then folks over on the Stratmore Street side come up, uh, and uh, Barb will be having the bread. I'll have the juice and just take it here so that way we're not passing it around. Uh, and if for some reason you feel more comfortable with those little prepackaged things that nobody has seen or touched or breathed on, we have those up here too. Uh, uh, so, uh, but the, the important thing is we want you to feel welcome at the table that has been set for us by Christ. Yeah, so you'll come up this way, Peter, and then go all the way back around. Thanks for that. And then this section will come up this way, and then you folks will come up this way. And it'll work. It'll be fine. The last thing I want to point out is the last hymn. I know the last hymn is a doozy, okay? It's going to be a hard one to sing. Uh, if, you, if the notes help you, they're in this book, and this book is on shelves in the back. So if you want to sing the last hymn, uh, you might want to grab this book because it'll help you. That's all that I have, and that's a lot. But I'll invite you all to stand now as Carly uh, calls us into worship. Please join me in the call to worship. We gather around the table in places far and near. We come with sourdough, rye, tortillas, crackers, wafers, and wonder bread. We come to this place at this time as the body of Christ. We gather together bringing wine or juice. It may be handmade chalices and silver goblets, paper cups, or little mini cups. We affirm that we have been changed by the blood of Christ. The bread and the cup unite us with all who would follow Jesus. This meal reaches back through the centuries, and it reaches around the world. Let us worship with the Lord with joy, with hope, and with gratitude.
let us unite our voices in prayer. God, God we, we confess, confess that, that we have, have not loved our neighbors, neighbors as, as ourselves, and yet, and yet you embodied yourself. You showed, you showed yourself to us in a human body. You lived out your life among those who were sick, physically, mentally, and spiritually. You reached out to touch them, spoke words to comfort them, performed miracles to heal them. Heal us, we pray. From the sin sickness that grips us, bring us away from the weariness and the selfishness that plagues us. Feed us in ways that will help us to work for the healing and wholeness of our neighbors. And we continue, meet us here, Lord, and then walk with us into the world you love. Amen. People of God, you know the good news. God has forgiven us all our sin, erasing the record that stood against us with our legal demands. Yes, this God set, this God set aside, nailing it to the cross. In Jesus Christ, therefore, therefore, we are forgiven. This is, in fact, the truth. We are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Surprise us, O God, with your truth, and open our hearts and our minds to your amazing love. Speak your word to us, silence in us any voice but your own, and be with us now as we turn our attention, our minds, and our hearts to you, and Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The gospel reading for today is Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 13. In those days, when there was again a great crowd without anything to eat, he called his disciples and said to them, I have compassion for your crowd, because they have been with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them away, hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come from a great distance. His disciples replied, How can one feed these people with bread here in the desert? He asked them, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven. Then he offered the crowd to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and after giving thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute. And they distributed them to the crowd. They had also a few small fish, and after blessing them, he ordered that these two should be distributed. They ate and were filled, and they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. Now there were about 4,000 people, and he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dothamathu. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, asking him for a sign from heaven to test him. 
And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to this generation, and he left them. And, getting into the boat again, he went across to the other side. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like now to invite the children uh, to come forward for a time, uh, a special time in the scripture. Hi, guys. All right. And there's space over here if you guys want to sit down over here and right on front. There's lots of space. Oh, I'm so happy to see everybody. That's a great spot. Sit right there if you want. Super. Great. Piper, there's nobody on that side of you, is there? I just want to make sure I can see everybody. I'm so happy to see everybody today. I was thinking earlier today about some of the things that we sort of do all the time, but we don't think about them. Like, have you ever been to a Pirates game? Has anybody ever been to a Pirates baseball game? There's something that happens in the seventh inning of a Pirates game. Every, it doesn't matter if the Pirates are winning, if the Pirates are losing, doesn't matter. And it, it's actually in every baseball game everywhere. Does anybody know what happens in the seventh inning? <laughs> the parole race. That's, that is what, one thing that happens in the Pirates game. There's another thing. Seventh inning stretch, where we all do what in the seventh inning stretch? Do you remember, Declan? We run around, that's the pierogi race. We run around the field. In the seventh stretch, we stand up and we sing. You guys know the song? Take me out to the ball game. Have you ever heard that song? You've heard that song. Do you know what? When your grandparents went to Pirates games, they sang that song. And when your grandparents' grandparents went to the game, they sang that song. We always sing that song at Pirates games and at every game. One other thing. I don't know how many of you are going to school in person now, but I'll bet that when you go to school, near the beginning of every day, is there one thing that kind of happens almost every day? Do you do... Uh, we call it's not quite the anthem the pledge of allegiance do you have a pledge at your school we all stand up and we look at the flag and we say I pledge allegiance to the flag why do we do those things why do we sing at a ball game why do we pledge allegiance to the flag do you have an idea It's one way of, say, of saluting God or one way of like saying what's important to us, right? So when we, uh, when we sing, take me out to the ball game, that's not necessarily saluting God, but it's remembering that we're a part of something bigger that, 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 and we're all in it together. When we pledge allegiance, that's a reminder that all over the world, all over the country, all over the country, students stand up and they say that. In church, a little bit, when it's right before it's time for us to do the baptism, we're going to say some words called the Apostles' Creed. That's what we do every time we have a baptism here. That's a way for us to remember that we didn't make this up. It's a way for us to remember that we're connected, that we belong to somebody bigger than us. When we get to the baptism, I want you to pay attention. When uh, Ron helps us to say that uh, affirmation, the, the Apostles' Creed, and help us to remember what's important and how we're connected to churches all around the world. And when I say that, like your grandparents' grandparents sang this, the uh, Take Me Out to the Ball Game, they've been saying the Apostles' Creed for almost 2,000 years. 
So your grandparents, 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 all the way back have said these words. They're important to us as we remember who we are. I'm super happy that you're here today. I'm glad that we could spend some time together. I'd like to ask us to pray together before we go back to our seats. Thank you, God, for giving us the opportunity to come and say again the things that are important to us. Help us to center in on the stuff that matters and to hold on to the way that you teach us who you are. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake, amen. Thank you, friends, for coming up. You can go back to your seats now. Well, some of our students have been looking forward to returning to in-class learning this pandemic. I wonder, what have you been waiting for during this pandemic? What is something to which you have been looking forward that has been delayed or interrupted? On October the 8th, something about the cinematic universe will feel a little bit more right when No Time to Die opens in movie houses around the United States. This film was to have opened in March of 2020, but, you know, COVID. But this week, James Bond is back. And you know, No Time to Die is hardly the first James Bond movie. In fact, uh, there have been 26 of these films spanning 58 years featuring 12 different Bonds. So if you don't want to pay attention to anything else I say, you can try to remember who all the different Bond people were. James Bond is a great example of our desire to find a character or a storyline that we like and keep coming back to it again and again. I mean, I don't know, maybe you're a fan of The Fast and the Furious or Batman. In, in those franchises, you know, it can just be sequel after sequel after sequel. And sometimes that works great. Toy Story 3, The Empire Strikes Back, I would argue that those are examples where the sequel is better than the original. Well, sometimes it doesn't work. Home Alone 4, Take Back the House. <laughs> Men in Black, International. I mean, really, do yourself a favor and do something more entertaining like going to the dentist. For a, for a sequel to work, it's got to have all of the meat and meaning of the original and bring something new to the table. Today's gospel reading is a sequel. That is to say, it reprises a, a, another event that had roughly the same plot and many of the same characters. I'll bet that you're familiar with the original, the day that uh, Jesus fed 5,000 on the hillside in Galilee. I mean, talk about your blockbusters. The feeding the 5,000, the only miracle that Jesus performed that shows up in all four of the Gospels. So I want to see what you remember about that story, about the original, before we get to the sequel that Carly read for you. So you might remember that the feeding of the 5,000 took place in Galilee, a Jewish region north of Jerusalem. Jesus had been teaching this crowd all day long, and he didn't want to send them home hungry. So in the original that wasn't read to you today, how many loaves of bread were there? Five. That's right. That makes sense because to the Jewish audience that heard that story, they might connect that with the five books of Moses. In the original, how many fish were there? 
There were two. The two tablets of the law. How many were fed in the feeding of the 5,000? It's kind of like who's buried in Grant's tomb. Except the texts all make it clear that there were 5,000 men present. They, they emphasize 5,000 men and their families. In the Jewish tradition, it took 10 men to form a community. And so it's been suggested that the number 5,000 could be understood to mean the five books of Moses times 10 men to form a community, times 10 times 10 to make an irrefutable demonstration of the presence of God in the midst of that place with those people. And on the day that the 5,000 were fed, were there leftovers? Yes. Remember? Of course, yes. How much was left over? Twelve basketfuls. Twelve baskets of leftovers. Well, twelve. Twelve tribes of Israel. Twelve followers of Christ. And, and just to make sure that we get this connection, when the Gospels talk about the baskets of leftovers, the word that they use for basket is Greek kofinos, a particular kind of woven character that is essentially a Jewish lunch bucket. Everybody, every Jewish person had a kofinos. Now, forgive me for all these numbers, but I just want to make it plain that the original, the feeding of the 5,000, is rich with symbolism indicating that Jesus, a Jew, has come to feed and to sustain the chosen people of God. That's the original. But now we're two chapters later in the gospel, and there's another multitude that gets fed. And what's up with this? Luke and John, they don't even bother mentioning it. They've got one great miracle feeding story, and that's enough for them. This one covers a lot of the same ground. And yet both Matthew and Mark decide that this is a sequel that's worth mentioning. The way that they tell this part of the story, we can see all kinds of similarities, and yet we can see that the meaning is enhanced by some of the new twists that we discover. So let's ask about this passage that you've just heard. We, we know from the preceding chapter that Jesus had left Galilee and gone into the region called the Decapolis, the Ten Towns. It's an area in what the Gospels call the Other Side of the Sea of Galilee. The Decapolis is where those people live. The folks who are not like us. The unclean. The unbelievers. The unwelcome. The unworthy. And in this account, how many loaves of bread are there? Seven, that's right. Well, what's that about? Well, in, in Deuteronomy and again in Acts, we are told that there are seven nations that were driven out of the promised land before the Jewish occupation of that space. Seven nations. Furthermore, seven represents the days of creation. Seven is a number for wholeness and completeness. What about the fish? Well, nobody knows. We're not told how many fish there are in today's reading. All we're told is that after he broke the, 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 the seven loaves, he distributed a few small fish too. And the number of people who were fed, 4,000. In Scripture, we read time and time again about the four corners of the earth, representing the totality of the whole world. The number four suggests completeness, totality, inclusivity. And lastly, in today's reading, how much was left over? Seven baskets. Seven baskets. Now, interestingly, while the Jewish leftovers are collected into the kofinos, the, the little Jewish lunch pails, these are gathered into spories, is the Greek word, spories. And, and that's the kind of basket that the Gentiles used. If the kofinos was a lunch bucket, a sporis was a laundry hamper. There was a lot left over. 
So, so what does this sequel add to our understanding of the whole story? I mean, the feeding of the 5,000, it was a blockbuster. It went pretty far in terms of establishing Jesus as a miracle-working teacher sent by God. What else do we see in this feeding of the 4,000? In today's Gospel reading, we see that Jesus is present, even in times and places where we're unsure of that. These people, these folks who are maligned and called racial slurs and scorned by the good people who go to church every week, claim God's blessing. They are so eager to be with Jesus that they come out and they stay as long as he is willing to stay. Whereas the folks in Galilee waited all day for the miracle of the loaves and fishes, these folks in the Decapolis are with Jesus for three whole days. They're out in the middle of nowhere that whole time, and by dusk on the third day, the granola bars and the juice boxes and the Lunchables are all gone, and there is nothing. But the folks won't leave. This Messiah who was willing to show up and meet them where they are. If there's one thing that this past 18 months have, has taught us is that we will find ourselves in difficult places and that we can grow tired of some of the places that we're in. We are so weary of virtual everything and protocols and negotiations and wondering how we're going to do this thing that we need to do and how we're going to do that thing that needs to be done while we're living in the shadow of this virus. It has been easy to feel forgotten or unseen or maligned or ignored or overwhelmed. Except, except that you are none of those things in the eyes of Jesus. The feeding of the 4,000 is testimony that even in those distant places where we're struggling with whether we're ever going to make it out or not, Jesus is there. Jesus is making the way for us. Jesus is sustaining us. And not only is Jesus present, but Jesus is enough. If, if you are someone who has always felt included, and maybe faith has come naturally and easily to you for your whole life, Jesus is enough for you. And if you are someone who has felt excluded, left out, marginalized, made to feel unwelcome, Jesus is enough for you too. In fact, those of you who are tempted to feel as though you are not somehow enough for the people in your world, I want you to remember right now that Jesus came out here looking for you and that Jesus didn't want to leave this place until he had found and fed the ones that other people were willing to forget. The feeding of the 4,000 includes a sentence that says, and all ate and were filled. That is to say, this was not a snack. They were completely satisfied by the presence and the gifts of the Christ among them. Jesus is enough, friends. Jesus is present. Jesus is enough. And lastly, Jesus is always on the move. He comes to this passage from a place called Tyre. And after he stays here for a few days, he heads back across the shore to the other shore where he is engaged in confrontation with the religious leaders. The Gospels continually point out how Jesus would alter the path of his journey in order to bump into more people. In fact, in a few moments, we will affirm in the Apostles' Creed that Jesus' path included a descent into hell. He is willing to go out of his way. Here's the deal. We have spent months in places that are new or unfamiliar or uncomfortable. We've had to develop new routines and patterns and learn new skills and new ways of relating. And Jesus has been there. As we look ahead at the days and weeks and months that are in front of us, we can trust that Jesus is already there. And not only is Jesus on the move, he invites us to travel with him to the other side. 
so that we who now represent the completeness of the body of Christ might be in a position to bring the gifts of presence and sufficiency to those who have felt pushed out. The feeding of the 5,000, I loved it. Two thumbs up. And yet I find that I like the sequel even better. And the good news for today, beloved of God, is that there is yet another production in the works every day as Christ meets you in the reality of your life, wherever and whoever you are, and sends you into the world that he loves. Thanks be to God. Amen. Joe and Delia, if you'd come forward. Beloved, hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember that I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Friends, this promise is for you and for your children, for everyone who God calls, those who are near and those who are far off. Obeying the word of our Lord Jesus, confident of his promises, we baptize those whom God has called. In baptism, God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death, uniting us 
in Jesus Christ with his death and resurrection. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and are joined to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. Let us remember our own baptism as we celebrate this sacrament. On behalf of the session, I present Nova Violet, child of Joseph and Delia, to receive the sacrament of baptism. Delia and Joe, do you desire that your daughter be baptized? Relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and to teach that faith to your child, do you? Do you, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture this child of God by word and deed, with love and prayer, encouraging her to know and follow Christ and be a faithful member of this church, do you? And those of you who are watching online, you can type in the comments now if you affirm this promise as well. Through baptism, we enter the covenant that God has established. Within this covenant, God gives us new life, guards us from evil, and nurtures us in love. In embracing that covenant, we choose whom we will serve by turning from evil and turning to Jesus Christ. As God embraces you within that covenant, I ask you to reject sin, to profess your faith in Jesus Christ, and to confess the faith of the church in which we baptize. Joe and Dahlia, do you renounce all evil and powers in the world which defy God's righteousness and love, do you? Do you renounce the sin that separates you from God, do you? Who is your Lord and Savior? And will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love until your life's end, will you? With the whole church, let us confess our faith. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again and ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, will you pray with me, please? Lord God, we thank you for your faithfulness that has been promised in this sacrament and for the hope that we have in your Son, Jesus Christ. As we baptize with this water, baptize us with your Holy Spirit, so that the things that we say may be your words, and that which we do may be your work. To you be all praise, honor, and glory through Jesus Christ our Savior, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns now and forever, one God. Amen. Hello, Peanut. Delia and Joe, what is your daughter's name? Nova Violet. Nova Violet, you are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. See what love God has for us, that we should be called children of God. That's who we are. Will you pray with me, please? Gracious God, we are so grateful for the gift of life, for Nova Violet, and for the ways that you have been present in her, to her, and through her, even in this short life. We pray that you would watch over her and guide her and guard her as she moves into the future that is already inhabited by you. We ask that you would bless her with a deep awareness of your presence, with a solid sense of your peace, 
and with the knowledge that your grace precedes her into every situation. We pray not only for Nova, but Lord, we, we pray for Aria and for her mom and dad, for Joe and Delia. And we ask that this family might be characterized by grace and peace and welcome. We ask that you would watch over them in their journeys, that you would establish that marriage stronger and deeper every day, and that you would guard and guide this household. In the name of Jesus, we pray, and for his sake, amen. All right, well, let's take a little walk, shall we? You want to take a little walk, see your neighbors? Well, this is Nova Violet, and I hope that you all remember this day, because I'm here to promise you that Nova will not. This day has precious little significance to Nova, not at least in terms of her remembered state. One of the reasons that in our tradition we baptize babies is because we want to hang on to the fact that we can only move forward in the sure and certain confidence that God is moving in our lives, God is present in our lives, even before we're able to reach out, even before we're able to call. God's grace is present and is with us before we have words to claim before we have a sense of knowing how to hold on to it. One of the tasks that you all have in the years to come is to remind Nova that she is a child of the covenant, to live in such a way so that she knows what grace is, what love is, and what peace is and to remind her that she was named in those things before she even knew how to talk. The grace of God for the people of God given in the gift of baptism. Let us pray together. Holy God, remind us of the promises given in our own baptism and renew our trust in you. Make us strong to obey your will and to serve you with joy. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, we have the opportunity now to come in to the presence of
There are a few things that I would like to lift up. I want to uh, join you all in congratulating Lil and John McConnell. Uh, their granddaughter, uh, Caitlin, had a baby girl yesterday. And if I hadn't been in the basement when Lil called me, I would have remembered that child's name. Uh, but had a baby girl yesterday at West Penn. Caitlin had a baby, uh, and everybody is doing well. Want to invite you to join members of our community in prayer. Uh, we lament the deaths of Susanna Meyer uh, and Mary Donovan. That's Bob's mother who passed away after a long battle with cancer. Uh, prayers for those who grieve. Uh, invite you uh, to pray for Billy and Melissa Paris, who are the nephew and his wife of Kathy Spears and Elaine Stanton. Uh, they've been struggling with COVID in Texas for a long time. Time. Billy is back in the hospital and now facing some blood clots and some issues there. Uh, so prayers for that situation. That's what I have in front of me. Perhaps I've forgotten something or you're aware of something of which I have not yet heard. Anything that you would share? Then let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you are present with and for, in and through and to us. We ask that as we lift up these concerns, those we have voiced and those that we have held close, that you would come and speak to the lives of your people. We pray that you would bless uh, those who grieve with hope and with joy, that you would bless those who struggle with illness, with health and wholeness, that you would comfort those who mourn that you would be present with those who feel lonely or isolated or cut off and that you would use us as an answer to prayer we pray these things in the strong name of jesus christ and for his sake amen and now not because we have to, but because we are grateful, let us return to God what is ours to share. Let us joyfully offer our time, our treasure, our commitment, and our prayers. Those who are worshiping in the building this morning will note that there are offering plates at the rear of the sanctuary. You may feel free to leave a gift there now or on your way out of the room in a few moments. Those who are worshiping online will find instructions on the screen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we know that these are only scrapes of paper, bits of metal, and electronic messages. Yet we ask that they might serve as symbols of our deep desire for your love to transform our time, effort, and substance into works of creative compassion for each other. For our water community and for the world beyond, through this church, make us yours every day in every way we pray. Amen. Beloved, we are here because Jesus has called us, strangers and friends, locals and visitors, believers and doubters, the certain and the curious. It is always a mixed company that Jesus gathers and invites to his table where in bread and wine he meets us. And through him, we who are different are joined to each other. So come, not necessarily because you understand, 
but because you have been understood. Come, not because of how you feel, but because God has food for you. Come, not because you deserve a place, but because Jesus invites you just as you are. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. We are delighted to share them together. Will you pray with me, please? Lord, we thank you for your presence here and now. We are grateful for the ways that you have been present to your people in the past, for calling light to come out of darkness, for dividing waters into the sea and into dry land, for creating the whole world and calling it good. We thank you for making us in your image to live with each other in love, for the breath of life, for the gift of speech, for the freedom to choose your way. You have mentioned and told and reminded us of your commandments through Moses and the prophets and through long generations. You have been fair and kind to all of your children. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who lived with us and shared our joy and sorrow. He told your story. He healed the sick. He was a friend of sinners. Obeying you, he took up his cross and was murdered by people that he loved. And we praise you that he is not dead, but that he is still a friend of sinners. And he has risen to rule the world. And now we trust in him to overcome every power to hurt or divide us, so that when you bring in your promised kingdom, we will celebrate the victory with him. And so we ask that you would give us your Holy Spirit and the breaking of the bread so that we may be drawn together and joined with Christ the Lord, receive new life, and remain your glad and faithful people until we feast with you in glory. You are the God who called us from death to life, and we give ourselves to you. And with the church through all the ages, we thank you for your saving love in Jesus Christ our Lord, who teaches us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, took bread and giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. As often as you do this, remember me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant, which is poured out for you in my blood. As often as you drink this, remember me. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Cut off from me, you can do nothing, but in me you will bear much fruit. As described earlier, I'd like to invite us to begin with the musicians, and then starting on this side, and you can just receive the elements up front. There's a little recycle bin there, and here are the ones that are sealed, if you'd prefer that.
Please join me in the prayer of communion. Lord God, in gratitude, in deep gratitude for this moment, this meal, these people, we give ourselves to you. Take us out to live as changed people because we have shared the living bread and cannot remain the same. Ask much of us, expect much from us, enable much by us, encourage many through us. So, Lord, may we live to your glory. Amen. Beloved, go out into the world in peace and have courage. Hold on to that which is good and return to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted and support the weak. Help the suffering and honor everybody. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. And let the whole church say, Amen. Amen.